Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have Mr. Optics Authority himself, Cody Nelson from the Outdoorsman. Cody, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Jay. Thanks for having me on today. It's been a while. We've been uh, we've been busy. Yeah, it's good. You know, the last time I saw you um, was at uh, probably Western Hunting Expo at the show, and then I've been traveling and uh, been in Colorado and what whatnot. But uh, looks like you guys were slammed at the at the Western Hunting Expo. Yeah, the shows never cease to amaze me on the amount of people and the attention and just I guess the excitement and you know the uh it's just it's always fun to go and meet our customers and you know meet new customers and and uh it's i mean it's it, the energy is always uh it's actually in humbling in ways and because you you know you get in your little bubble when you're at the shop all the time and then you get out and you realize holy cow there's a lot of other people out here and it's just it's, there's there's always a lot going on so it's a uh, it's a fun experience for sure Cody, as a business owner, when you look at your show schedule, um, I know you do like Dallas SCI, you do SCI, you do the Sheep Show, you can add in others if I forget them, but Western Hunting Expo, each yeah, we, one of we, those shows, Yep. go ahead. Yeah, yeah I was going to tell you, we don't do Dallas, um, and not because, it, that, that Dallas is just a really long show for us to get to, and so... Um, we've been doing uh, uh, the sheep show in Reno. We've been doing the the SCI in Las Vegas, and then we do the the Salt Lake City show, of, you know, for Western Hunter. So that's what we've been you, concentrating on. When you're looking at these shows as a business owner, obviously each one of the shows has a different demographic and and you know different group and types of people coming. You know, maybe SCI might be a little more prone to worldwide hunting, whereas the Western Hunting Expo might be, you know, a more Western-focused hunting, and um, and then you've got the sheep show that's very focused on, you know, sheep. Um, how do you, as a business owner, you know, go into it with a mindset of, okay, this is the sheep show, or okay, this is the Western Hunting Expo, or this is the SCI? I mean, are you basically doing your same thing, or do you have kind of a mindset that, you know, you need to talk about certain things, or how does that work as a business well, owner? Well, I think the main thing, Jay, is that we always try to keep on the forefront um, is that, um, you know, I mean, and let's face it, we, we're a business, and so the goal of that business is to make money, but, you know, the, the idea is is that, you know, we are always um, first and foremost trying to, uh, you know, meet our customers, uh, develop that relationship, develop that trust, develop the the, the ability to um, you know uh, talk with them, educate them, and and to be perfectly honest too, we we educate ourselves, we learn stuff new from our customers all the time. So, you know that I, I think it's just a very hands-on approach to getting out to those shows, and you know uh, I, I've said this for years and. Um, I, I think it's always my uh, my goal is to out service and out knowledge, you know, our competition. And um, you know, it's kind of fun too because we get to see some of our competitors there. And you know, you realize we're all you know trying to do the same thing, and that's you know provide a good service and, and quality product to our customers. Um, so from an outsider's perspective, looking in, and not necessarily from my perspective because I feel like I know you so well. Um, but I, I could see from a third party how, on the face value of it, you would not see where there is a difference between, you know, why does it really matter uh, whether, you know, I buy my optics from you or from someone else? Um, from your perspective, how would you answer that question as far as... Well, I, I think it, it should matter who you buy from, and, and I would say this, it's real simple. Um, do you trust a guy that is taking optics out on his leisure time and work time and looking through all the glass and actually comparing them side by side and, and using them in hunting situations and forcing himself to, to not use his comfort zone all the time um, to where he knows the answers to the questions that come up from people that have situations in the field? Um, so, I, 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 I mean... I, it, it experiences everything with me, um, and I would just tell you that if you're not talking to somebody and you're not, 
you know, asking questions about what that person's experience in the field, you know, I, I it, you know, it'd be kind of like going to to buy a race car and you know, do you, you want to talk to the guy that's in the stands or do you want to talk to the guy that's actually driving the cars? When that when you do mind. talk to your customers, Cody, um, we all, you know, I would say we all have our ways of doing things. And I hear you talking about learning from customers. Are there times, though, when you're talking to customers and you just know deep down in your heart that the way that they're doing it or their style needs improvement? And do you ever in interject yourself into that and say, hey, you might try this, this, and this and see if that gives you some improvement? Or do you typically wait until a customer says, hey, I you know, kind of want to know how you do this? Or, or do you... You know, do you proactively say, you know, hey, are you glassing with your binoculars on a tripod, and and do you have a head that's you know fluid and not rickety? I mean, do you do you get, well, you know, think, do you do you interject or do you kind of wait to see what they're they're doing? You know, Jay, I think you take every situation as it comes along, and and you know there are guys, and you know you just get to know people and and know people, you know, maybe guys are shy about saying something or, you know, maybe they just come full front at you and tell you how they do it and ask you what your opinion is. And I, I'm always real careful not to offend somebody, but, you know, certainly when somebody gives you the, hey, look, this is the way I'm doing it, um, but I'd really, you know, like to know exactly how you guys do it or, you know, what your experience with this is. I mean, y'all. I always give them my honest opinion and, and and what you know what I feel works. But at the same time, there's there's certain situations where a guy will say something, they'll do something, and I'll literally ask him, "Hey, why you know why do you do that? Why do you do it that way?" And they'll take you down the road, and pretty soon they'll they'll give you an answer, and and maybe they're not getting the results that they're wanting, and then you say, well, have you ever thought about trying it this way? Because, and so there's just always you know real good ways to to talk to people, and and you know you might some people need to be hit over the head you know with a hammer, and some people you know are really you know they're actually really anxious to get as much information as they can out of you, so. Um, I think you just got to read the situation to to what it you know to who the person is and what they're asking what they're stating. I get a lot of podcast questions um, by email or by Instagram, and it, it usually goes like this: I have a good pair of ten power binoculars that I wear around my neck. I'm wondering if it's more important for me to have a great spotting scope or a pair of 15 power binoculars what is your opinion and of course you know then I ask them a series of questions but I want to hear your answer to the question that I'm sure if I get that question a lot you probably get it all the time well you know Jay I, I, I think you know and just to make sure repeat the question just so I make 100% sure and that's probably half the the battle time is making sure that I'm completely. Yeah, they say I have in. a good, I have a good pair, not a great pair, but a good pair of ten power binoculars that I wear around my neck, and those are my everyday binoculars that I carry. Sure. I'm looking to upgrade my binocular or my optics game. Should I go with a pair of 15s or a great spotting scope? Granted, I always answer both, um, but. Uh, <laughs> But there are people out there that, you know, the, the budgets are limited and what have you, and they have to, you know, maybe get different pieces of optics over time. Um, what, how would you answer that if, you know, you know like they've that got their, their question, hand? Uh, yeah. I, I would almost, uh, that typical question I would almost always answer, um, keep, the, the, keep the, the, the tens on your chest, um, I don't know that the, 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 you know, if you've already got a pair of 10s on your chest, um, you know, you're going to do, you know, just fine with those hand holding and it served you well. Um, but I would always lean towards going for the highest quality glass and putting it on the tripod. So for that given scenario, you know, I would, I would tell somebody to get, you know, the 15s and put them on a tripod before they did anything else. Yeah, and I think don't uh, I mean don't you think it's important? And and most of the time I answer saying, 
what type of hunting do you do most, where do you live, how many days are you out hunting, what is the primary animal that you're hunting, exactly. and, you know, if they tell me, oh, I'm hunting elk in the high country of Colorado, then I might say, well, stick with your tens, but hey, get an outdoorsman's bino adapter, even if your uh, binos are not, you know, top of the line, you can still adapt them, put them on a tripod. Because wouldn't you agree, Cody, that even mediocre binoculars, if they're steadied on a tripod, you're going to end up getting a lot better well, use I'd out of that them. That goes back to, to our, you know, and what we've said for years and, you know, even before I was at the Outdoorsman's, you know, if you will, you know, get the best glass you can afford and, and for some people that's just, you know, it, maybe that's from a $200 pair to a $500 pair. It doesn't matter. But if you will take those glasses, regardless of their quality, put them on a tripod, and you will methodically slow down and, and spend time in places looking and, 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 you know, really try to pay attention to what's going on instead of looking for five minutes and leaving, um, I think guys will find flat out, bar none, period, um, no questions asked, you will find more game just by doing, you know, those three simple things. Yeah. And I mean, I agree with you 100%. You know, if, if put, put the mediocre binoculars on a tripod, one, but in the situation where, you know, guys high country elk hunt, where, you know, an elk's not too hard to spot, I would say, go with the spotting scope in that scenario. Sure. If, well, I mean, I think if, guys, someone, if someone calls and says, hey, I'm in Nevada and I'm doing, you know, lots of open range mule deer glassing, I would say go with a great pair of 15s because you're going to spend a lot more time sitting and picking stuff apart. So, I mean, correct. It, it's funny how the optics game and the, the answers that you give, it's totally indicative of, like what the situation and what the primary use is, wouldn't you agree? No, it has to be. You know, but the, yeah. but your scenario of of you know going, people would be amazed, Jay, if they just took the the pair of binoculars that they have and put them on a tripod. Whether I don't care whether they're eights or tens or you know or whatever, if they if they'll put them on a tripod or you know somehow secure them so that they're not moving, they will absolutely find more game. Yeah. So, I mean, I think they would be surprised in what they see with an 8, you know, on a tripod or a 10 on a tripod. So um, yeah. some guys, just to lighten their load, you know, maybe they want to just carry the 10s in a, in a, in a, uh, uh, a spotting scope or a tens and you know maybe guys don't like looking through spotting scopes and they want to look through you know with their with both eyes open and they use 15s that's fine too um but you know it, it again it just depends you know some guys always say oh well, i only use a spotting scope to judge quality well that's okay you know some guys will some guys you know want to do just you know look for quality some guys are looking at a specific spot that's far off there's there's a lot of different scenarios that you got to work through yeah, I, I do like how, you know, as, as a business owner, you can adapt as far as, I mean, I've seen you in action either at a show or at the, at the shop where people come in and they may have a preconceived notion of this is what they want and they may end up leaving with something completely different and perfectly happy, but they realize after talking to you guys that, you know, what they thought they wanted, they really needed something else. Um, and it just took a little bit of talking to someone and trying to figure out in their situation what was the best, you know, tool for their trade. And I think that's why you guys do so well with, you know, your customers is you've got a lot of hands-on experience. And, um, it, you know, I, I think that speaks for itself. Um, I do have a quick question for you. I'm all ears. I was wondering if your head was getting big from getting mentioned on the Joe Rogan podcast. Oh, buddy, are you kidding me? I was so, <laughs> that was so fun that uh, you know uh, Jake had it on here in the shop, and and I, I, you know we listened to it you know often, and uh, and 
you know, he started talking about stuff, and he mentioned you, and 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 then he mentioned you know the outdoorsmen, and you know I could hear the excitement in the guys, and I mean, yeah, that, that's a man, that's a that's a that's a choke of you know choke on feel good kind of moment right there. That was a yeah, that was a pretty cool experience. So I I you know I got to thank Joe for that. One day I'll meet him. But uh, you know what I think uh, is so cool about him is, um, you know, he. he been getting more and more into hunting and he's been getting more and more into archery and shooting and it's you know become a part of his life and and um he, quest he's, for knowledge yeah he, <laughs> that's what i was going to say i was going to call it like the thirst for knowledge because exactly it seems like everything that he does he he's he's open-minded uh you know where he he wants to hear all of the situation he wants to hear all of the breakdown he wants to you know, he wants to learn, and I think that's so cool to have someone that's in the spotlight like he is, um, having such a passion for hunting. And um, uh, you know, I'm fortunate he listens to my podcast and sends me messages quite often. And um, you know, I just think, uh, you know, it's 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 not often that you have someone that is as much. You know, he's got the vo- uh, the ear of a lot of people and. Um, I really think he can do a lot of good for hunting in general and bow hunting, um, archery as well. Um, I just think he can, you know, he can bend some people that might be in the middle to, you know, not make them, you know, from anti-hunter to, to Jay, I, I, you know, I think liking that, hunters, but like people that are in the yeah. middle that can be like, yeah, okay, Joe's, I, I, you know, Joe's on a quest for, to, to, you know, learn to be a great bow hunter. I think it's amazing, Jay, that, you know, and look, and I mean, you know, I, I've always known who Joe Rogan is, and, you know, and then when I, you know, heard him going out with, uh, um, I'm not sure exactly how all that started between him and uh, Renella and Remy Warren and all those guys, um, but, I, you know, you got to sit back and look at that and go, well, I mean, is that kind of a representation of, you know, there's a lot of people that, that have, you know, they've gone their whole life and not been in the hunting, and they, you know, in their mid-30s or 40s, or I don't care, you know, some guys in their 50s, they're kind of starting this whole new program over, and they're wanting to do things for themselves, and, and they're wanting to kill their own game, and, 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 and so, I mean, can you think of a better representative of somebody like that that's doing that, that, that was never a hunter before, and now is just like, holy cow, there's this whole other lifestyle out there, you know, that... that well, I, just, I think that's one thing that, you know... Is, is pretty unique about him because he was not a hunter and now he is. And I think from an impact standpoint, he can actually impact a lot more people, I think, Absolutely. than some of us that, that have been doing it a long time and, you know, we're kind of known for being hunters and what have you. You take a guy that's never done it and then all of a sudden he's just infatuated with it and, and has, a, has a true passion for it. You know, and, and wanting to learn everything about archery and all the mechanics and, you know, the proper ways and the improper ways and why things, you know, why an arrow flies wrong and, you know, all that, all that technical stuff that, you know, go, goes into our sport. It's, um, it's pretty neat. And, and um, so, anyway, I just had to kind of rib you about that. Oh, yeah. I, I want to well, talk to you. It was certainly uh, fun, though. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. I want to talk to you today about rangefinders, um, sure. and I know you guys at the Outdoorsman carry a wide variety of rangefinders. So, I was wondering you can kind of take the stage and and decide how you want to go through them. Um, well, whether you, know, Jay, you I think whether you talk I, I about think the first thing that should be said is is that there is so much going on right now with rangefinders, um, you know, and we've been kind of saying it. Um, for, you know, the, I don't know, the last couple, three years anyway, that the next, you know, three years ago we were saying, God, the next three to five years is going to be, you know, super, super exciting, you know, for rangefinders because, you know, uh, people are working on their own um, designs and, and, you know, the rangefinder market has, uh, you know, the last ten years anyway, you know, it's been a couple of designs, and you know, all your your compact range finders were pretty similar, and so there's been there's been so much likeness, and and now you're starting to see some some really cool things come out, and so 
I, you know, I'd like to say, you know, that I, I think we're just getting to the really, really cool, you know, uh, situations where, that, I mean, 10 years ago, I, we may have thought about this stuff, but it was such, it was light years away. We didn't know how we were going to get there. And uh, so I think there's some really cool products coming out. And I think this is just a really, very, very exciting time for rangefinders because, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, uh, the the um, what's the word I'm looking for? The the technology that's going into these and and how these things are coming about is, you know, I, I'm sorry. Ten years ago, we were just scratching our heads like, how are we going to do this? And yeah. uh, and I'm excited about it. So um, yeah, I mean, we, well, I think we can, the other thing to add to that, Cody, is not only technology and all the un- unbelievable things, but I mean, the price point that some of these things are coming on, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you'd be like, yeah, that's going to cost like five grand. Exactly. And, you know, now you're getting stuff, you know, under a thousand bucks and it's like, well, it's doing uh, what? One of the one that, like Vortex is, you know, they're 1300, their new Ranger 1300 is 299 bucks. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, you know, I mean, if we would have had that, you know, I mean, it would have taken a lot of guesswork out of stuff, and man, there's a couple bucks I'd go back and I'd, I'd have rethought my uh, my 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 ranges when we when we were doing that. You know, um, if we had had yeah. uh, th- those items with us, it, it changed a lot of a lot of stories would, would would change. I can tell you that. Why don't so, you take um, some time here and and kind of yeah, break let me them tell down you about some of the stuff that, that's out there. Um, the the one that that uh, is really exciting right now, um, and 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 it's this. It, I, I you know, I get little tidbits of stuff, and and I, I love when we know things are coming. But when you know things are coming, and and you just don't really know how good they are yet, that's always an interesting um, deal. When they show up, you get re- really excited about them. The the Zeiss RFs, you know, they're Victory RFs. Um, basically, if you take the Zeiss Victory R- R- binocular, which uh, you know they come in a, uh, an 840, or I'm sorry, an 8, uh, uh, 845, a 1045, and a um, and then an 854 and a 1054, uh, and, I, and I back, back up a minute, Jay. There's 842 and 1042s, and then it's the 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 uh, 854 and 1054 power binoculars. They have come out with a um, rangefinder that is in the body of the the, the the binocular without creating extra you know any extra. Um, uh, you don't have to have a laser beam, you know, like out of the center hinge pin. You know, there's no extra anything on this binocular. It looks just like the Victory HT binoculars, okay? So, in other words, there's no wings, there's no nothing. It's just inside, nothing. and you, you would yeah. never even know it's a range yep. binocular. The, um, the cool part about it is is that where you would normally grab the tubes, um there is two buttons just in front of the main hinge, you know, uh, uh, body, if you will. And one of them is your, your, your mode button, and one of them is your range button. And what's really cool and significant about this entire binocular is that it is compatible, and it, there's an, uh, an app that you download on your phone, and, it give, and it's Bluetooth compatible, and so, basically, you go in and set up that binocular for your specific ballistics, and uh, you can even change the button to whether, if you're right-handed or left-handed, you can change it, whether you're a bow hunter or a rifle hunter, or, um, I mean, you can put your custom, you know, ballistics in there so that it, it, it's, and it's all on your phone. We, and it, I, it's it, it's nothing short of amazing to have that capability. Um, all the bow hunters out there uh, um, that have always asked why this is not available, um, it's now available. These so in other words, you like, can shoot your bow through a chronograph. You can weigh your arrows. You can shoot your 
bullets through a chronograph. You can weigh well, your it, bullets, it, it all the different a, stuff, and it, it calculates all that. Well, it, well, it has a bow mode on on the on the uh, on the particular um, binocular, but it's what it's what, what what it allows you to do custom, Jay, is um, is basically to go in with a rifle and. Um, it's where I, I think you're going to see more benefit out of that um, because of the shorter distances in the rifle. But the beauty part about this is it ranges the angle, um, you know, from ten to uh, ten to a thousand yards. Okay. So it, 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 yeah. So there's well, in actually, and, and did um, I hear you say the button can go on either side? The button can go. Yeah, button can go on either side. So do you and order I, it left or right, or can you change it? What, no, no, no. It, it, it. Y- there's a, a point in the setup where you actually change it to what side you prefer it. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, which is, you know, I mean, th- no one's been able to do that yet, and it's, I mean, that's just going to change a lot of people that are both bow hunters and rifle hunters, and and I want to make sure something's clear. The, um. They, Zeiss is, uh, you know, we haven't received our first, um, I mean, we have a set here in the shop, but we haven't received the, the first shipment coming over from Zeiss yet. Um, that's, it, we're still about, uh, last I was told, we were, we're about a month out. Um, and the, uh, they're, they're saying that the angle is um, from 10 to 2,500 yards in that particular binocular. So, wow. And that's the thing is, is that they've done with all these different um, uh, range finders, Jay, you know, there's, there's, you know, the yardages you get for, you know, the total, what's the farthest capable of it, and then you get the, you know, is it, you know, will it actually change your, your, uh, your, your angle for, you know, your line of sight versus, you know, your, your computing the angle in it. And so a lot of those distances are much shorter than the overall distance is. So, um, and I'm not sure if I'm, you know, what, confusing what kind you of response? or, but you've really got to pay attention to the different binoculars out there because they're going to give you the shortest distance, they're going to give you the longest distance, and that's if the conditions are, are perfect and it's, you know, reflective targets versus non-reflective targets. So... Um, you know, I would just tell guys that they really need to pay attention to what they're, you know, what they're reading and what, you know, all these binoculars have different ranges that they do, you know, for estimating the, you know, the corrected, you know, shoot for distance is what I like to call it. Very interesting. Uh, so, but the when, when you take the, real fast, the question would yeah, be, yeah, no. how is, when you hit the button, you have them in the shop. How quick of a response or a readout compared to some of the other range finding binoculars? Well, you know what's is interesting it? is is that like the Zeiss, the Zeiss has always been a a very fast readout, and you can actually um, you can pick up you know five different range finders and you can you know you can you know activate the button and then click and um, the, the and I and I. There has been certain rangefinders that are notoriously slower than others, um, and that have since been fixed. Um, but there, y- you can tell that there is a difference between that relay time. And so, um, you know, keeping your binoculars still when you're when you're ranging will make your readout more accurate. Accurate, it, it, and yeah. it's 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 the only way to put it. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things out there. Um, you know, we, people always ask us, well, can I tripod mount these? And, you know, certain binoculars you can and certain others you, you can, but you have to have different ways of doing it. But ultimately speaking, if you can mount your rangefinder on, uh, you know, on a tripod and, and use that for ranging, uh, you know, especially in rifle, obviously rifle hunting conditions, um, it, it will make your readouts more accurate, period. I mean, that's just, it's a given fact. So when, when will Zeiss, when do you think you'll have um, a bunch of these in stock, and what's kind of their rollout period on them? 
Uh, well, I mean, the yeah, they're, they're six I mean, months. Uh, they were really shooting for March one, and um, Zeiss, uh, you know, just the, I, I, you know, I, I think it's when anybody rolls out a new product, they, they, you know, they always are going through checks, balances, making sure that everything is what they say it is, making sure that all the production units are coming out. Um, and, you know, and sometimes that takes a little bit of time, but uh, the last update that we were given was is that we should probably see these, um, you know, in the middle of uh, middle of middle of April, uh, May May first is what the the target date is right now. So, and you're looking at uh, they're right at thirty they're thirty four thirty four thirty five hundred dollars. So they're, they're a little bit that. more expensive than the well. I mean, you're like a, you know a ten forty two EL range is is thirty two ninety nine. So I think the pricing that the Zeiss it's it, you know it, it's appropriate for what its capabilities are. Very cool. I haven't seen those yet. That uh, sounds exciting. So the other so the Zeiss is really um, kicking it in gear, and you've got uh, the Swarovski and the Leica. Uh, range finding binoculars. Why don't you talk about the other range finding binoculars? Yeah, so you've got you know Ge the the Geovid, the Leica Geovids are coming out. Um, they've and when I say that they're coming out, they're using the same body styles. Um, the 2700R will be like the original Geovid, um, and then the the H the uh, the the 3000 HDBs will be like the new um, Geovids and. Uh, so we're really excited for those two. We've gotten, you know, the HDBs, Jay, uh, uh, you know, you have a, uh, an SD card that you actually load into the binocular with your, your ballistics. Um, so that allows you to, again, you know, have your shoot four distances and, you know, that, that are taking ranges and calculating out, you know, for, for the given conditions at the time. So the, the range finding aspect of things, um, and this is why I just ask people to you know, either give us a call or please you know, read the technical data because there is so much out there and people really need to pay attention to what you know, all these different um, uh, range finders are capable of. So I mean, there's, you know, there's certain range finders out there too that we don't carry um, that you know, are good products too. So I, I think people really just need to look um, and you know, really pay attention to what their needs are. And again, just just like we were talking about earlier with you know making a sale, people really need to pay attention to what their needs are and what the capabilities are of that particular rangefinder. Um, so yeah, we're, uh, we're really excited about the, the 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 new longer distances out of the Geovids. Um, the R series is in that twenty five twenty six hundred dollar range. The HDB series is in the uh, the they're right at twenty nine ninety nine, so three thousand dollars. And then uh, v Vortex now has their 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 uh, Fury binocular. Uh, that's a uh, eleven uh, twelve hundred dollar binocular, um, and that's a new uh, binocular for them this year. Um, that's been, you know, seems to be doing pretty good. Um, so it's it's much, uh, it's more on an economical level um, with their, you know, their Viper HDs and their their Razor HD binoculars, and uh, so that that's been a, a pretty popular seller. And then also um, Vortex also has the new Ranger 1300 and the Ranger 1800 out. So uh, we've been taking orders on those and getting those filled. So that's been pretty successful. So a lot of these well, companies, Jay, have basically extended the ranges of their binoculars. Their, you know, their, I'm sorry, their range finders. And uh, so I think that's why you're seeing a resurgence of all the, 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 the like the, the compact range finders and the, and the, uh, the new binoculars with, uh, with larger uh, you know, ranging capabilities is what it comes down to. What about Swarovski? Anything new from them? Uh, on the rangefinder front, um, there is nothing yet. Um, you know, their their EL range has been um, an extremely popular skew for us. Um, we, uh, generally speaking, we sell an absolute boatload of those every year. Um, and you know, obviously, it's always it's tripod mountable with our our stud and. Um, yeah, you know, we range those out, you know, fairly often, you know, past 2,000 yards, um, and it does the angle and gives you the corrected distance. So that's always a, 
a bonus, and you know, and, and obviously it's got some of the best glass in, in you know the world in it. So that seems to be a uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a tried and true you know staple for us. I was going to ask you, as a, as a dealer of all these different manufacturers, um, how do you walk the line of having <laughs> all the brands? They're obviously all these companies. I mean, and and the listeners, if they don't know. Just like any other business, I mean, these companies are fiercely competitive with each sure. other. And I would think it'd be a little hard to be in your position, Cody, and kind of walking the, the tightrope of, you know, you, you're trying to make a sale of, of one of the products, whether it be, you know, any one of the manufacturers we mentioned. Um, and it's probably sometimes hard for you because, Maybe you have certain brands that you know over time you just you know become you know get where you lean on them, and then are there times when other companies you know come up with some new stuff that's like wow, uh, the game is on. But don't you think that competition yeah, think between it, the companies is great? I, I think well, I, well, first of all, that's what drives it. You know, I mean, the you know the the the. The, the, they know that the, uh, the you know the public is asking for it. They, they, they. I think it's great that they're driving each other. And I think that the year question to me is, it's it's what we talked about in the beginning of the podcast here is that I, we do walk a fine line because I represent all these. And the fact of it is, is that you know I would love for all of these lines to be successful in everything that is that I, that we sell because. You know it, that just means that we're we're servicing a great number of people. You know, from uh, you, you got to take into account you know people's you know uh, expertise. You know, some people have um, uh, you, you know you know budgetary concerns. It doesn't matter. It all comes back to when we start talking to people and we start finding out what they need. Maybe they have budget constraints. Maybe they maybe they don't care. You know, we have. You know, people that walk in the door, and you know, I could give them every opinion that they ever asked for, and they're going to do what they want to do because they want to do it that way. Totally understand, but it all comes back to we try to educate our buyers and provide that service of figuring out, hey, how can we help you get into the binocular rangefinder or product that best suits your needs. And and I right. think Jay, that's the, the you know that's the that's the key to what we do. I, I mean that I, that's, I, that's exactly what we do. I got a question for you on these um, Zeiss uh, Victory RF. What uh -huh. kind of light transmission? So if you're to look through the regular Zeiss binocular, that's well, you know you said that you can't tell a difference. Uh, can you, when you walk out of the shop, noticeably tell a difference in light transmission, or I, I are these companies that, getting better and better with with that? Well, I, I think that these guys have hit the, the, the. I mean, they've hit it out of the park on this one because when you compare the HD regular HDs to these, um, I, Jay, I don't. There, there's no discernible difference between these two. My, I look through binoculars every day, and my eyes can't tell. And you know, when, and does when, that include I, low light? Like, I mean, oh yeah, when I went to the shot show, and I, they, their, their explanation to me was because it was one of the first questions I asked, is that the same glass, same coating, same everything that was on those, you know, regular H Victory HTs, is the same glass that's that's in these Victory RFs. So, I, and I think right. that's fantastic. Um, you know, I, I know that, uh, that, you know, they've been working on that stuff for, for years, and I think, you know, everybody just keeps pushing the edge with it, and I think they've, they've done a really nice job with that glass. The Germans and the Austrians are going for oh, it, they just, they? Yeah, they keep getting after it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's that good competitive spirit, right? Good stuff. Okay, so we've talked about range-finding binoculars. Um, yep. What about just the handheld unit um, uh, range finders? My first question would be before you dive into it: Are you seeing a trend where most people lean towards the range finding binocular and don't get it, you know, just a regular handheld range finder, or 
are you seeing lots of guys that just have their normal pins or whatever around their neck, and then they're going to carry a, a, a handheld rangefinder on their side? I would tell you, Jay, that the, the, the trend that I see probably most right now is that the archery hunter is typically still leaning on the, the compact rangefinders as in where the rifle hunters now i'm not saying that some archery guys don't i'm just saying that i i get a lot of requests from most of the archery hunters um that really want to use a compact range finder in the way because when they set up to shoot um i think it's just easier for them to make the transition you know from from you know taking a range than to uh, uh, you know put a binocular up and it, it's just don't you think a lot of that Cody has to do with how um, big the rangefinder binocular and not not that they're actually physically that big but they're bigger than the little handheld that guys can hold in their hand but don't you think also with the early technology of some of the rangefinding binoculars you know obviously with Swarovski you know I, I know they lost a lot of guys that when when they would only range out to 33 yards and over so they didn't range anything under that um i think they lost some guys also guys saying the buttons on the wrong side but you you said something earlier where you know mounting a, a rangefinder binocular on a tripod you have to hold it very steady to get the most accurate reading well i can tell you that trying to range through a rangefinding binoculars with some of the older technology, either the button, the way you had to hold it, you know, if you had a little shake in your hand, you were not getting a, 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 a quick reading at times, whereas I think the little handhelds, they're pretty easy and, and you know, they, they handle, they perform better under that circum, circumstance. Do you think right. the range-finding binoculars will continue to get better and maybe some of the archers will start transitioning oh, over especially I, I, especially if they're going to read under 30 yards and you know that that 10 to you know 10 well, to 50 I, I yards I would range. have to think Jay that that's going to continue just to get better and better they always do um you know uh I think that was one of the things that you know when like a um you know, they made sure that their angle compensation was from 10 yards to, you know, the six or, you know, 800 yards in the, the GeoVid Rs. And, you know, that's been a really strong seller for, for guys getting into the, um, you know, the, the, the binocular rangefinder uh, market. Um, yeah. So, I, 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 again, I, it, it comes back to that, you know, the customer tells us what he's doing and what he likes and you know you listen to the way that they do things and some guys like the the compact rangefinders some guys like the binoculars so the best part is is I, we get to service them both ways yeah i think one thing too that probably a lot of the public and you know certainly some of the listeners of this podcast don't understand is how much patents Oh. Different companies own patents on things, and it makes other companies challenged because you can't, you know, without paying that other company for their patent. Yep. Um, there's some serious, uh, I don't know what the word is, but there's some serious competition with all these different patents. You've even got companies that have patents on stuff that don't even actually have them in their own binocular range-finding binocular, but they've got patents that kind of block other people from even being oh. able to enter into that arena. So the creativity that some of these um, designers that work for all these manufacturers have to go through, I'm sure it's just, it, it's, it's not as easy as just, just make it like this because some other company may have a patent that doesn't allow them you know, to have a button on one side or the other or to be able to have a mirror that, you know, reflects something in a certain way or, you know, have a laser that's in a certain spot. Would you agree? Uh, I would absolutely agree um, because yeah. the, 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 uh, the patents has, for, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, the patents is basically what's been slowing the rangefinder market up, you know, for... Because a, a lot of the technology has been there, but it's the patent infringements that 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 uh, have have really kind of slowed the whole process up. 
So some yeah. guys are getting really creative and really, uh, in, you know, uh, uh, inventive with the way that they're doing these things. And it's and this is, you know, this is what we're starting to see. The, I mean, we are starting to see this right now. You know, I haven't heard you say much about loophole. I know you carry loophole. Um, what kind of range finding capabilities? I mean, I, I use their little 1600 uh, I TB, TBRW. Well, my um, wish is, is that they would, you know, um, I, I wish they would come out with a, a, a binocular because I think there's a marketplace for it. Um, but, you know, I've been using and I like um, very much so their, uh, um, their, uh, the, the 1200 TB, I, th- I believe it's TBR. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, you know, total ballistic range, um, I think that thing has been fantastic. And so, yeah. um, you know, I, I know they've done really good with their range uh, finding systems. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, again, they're compact range finders, and I think they've been, they've been doing pretty good with them. So um, I, I know guys like them. I know guys like them for both archery and, um, uh, you know, both archery and rifle. So I think they have a, a, a place in, in both arenas. And uh, so, you know, they've been, they've been doing really good for us. We've sold actually quite a bit. That's good. Is there any out there that we haven't mentioned? If not, I want to move on to um, carrying dumbbells around out on, on your back. <laughs> um, you know, uh, God, Jay, uh, you know, the Geo, like I said, you got the, the new, the new Zeiss R, Victor RFs, the, the GeoVid 2700 uh, Rs and the 3000 uh, HDBs. You know the new Ranger uh, compact uh, 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 rangefinders from Vortex in the 1300 to 1800. Um, the new Furies, um, yeah. So I mean, there's been all kinds of uh, of fun and activity for this year on in the in those fronts. So um, if anybody's got questions, have them call us and and we'll work through it with them and find out what what products you know best serve them their their needs and we'll go from there. Okay, sounds good. I want to take just a second to thank the sponsors of this podcast. Um, Gohan Insider has been the title sponsor of this podcast virtually from the beginning. And I want to remind you guys, this is application season, and if you're applying in all these western states, uh, you need to use the Gohan Insider uh, as the resource tool to be able to get the most accurate draw odds and harvest statistics. All you have to do is go to gohunt.com forward slash insider, click on the blue join now button, use the J. Scott promo code, you're actually going to get a $50 Go Hunt gear shop gift card. I want to thank Go Hunt for their sponsorship. I also want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting, that's K-U-I-U.com. If you want to go on there and see their website and see all of the great ultralight hunting products that they make, uh, I would appreciate that. I appreciate Jason Harrison sponsoring this podcast. The Outdoorsman's, Cody Nelson, who I'm speaking with right now, the Optics Authority, uh, Outdoorsman's.com, 1-800-291-8065. If you use the J. Scott promo code, you're going to get a 10% uh, discount there when you, when you uh, order stuff of the Outdoorsman's products there. And I appreciate, Cody, I appreciate your sponsorship. Uh, We've had a nice uh, long run, and it's been a good partnership for both of us. I want to thank you for that. And then Phonescope.com, if you use the JScott16 promo code at Phonescope.com, you're going to get a 10% discount. Cody, let's talk about the um, Atlas Trainer. And did you know, well, let me back up. Did you know that I have two doll sheep hunts coming up this summer? I know. You're pretty lucky, and I'm a little, uh, just a little (laughs) bit jealous. My my wife likes to refer <laughs> refer to this summer as the fifty thousand dollar summer, no. <laughs> and she, she she doesn't really say it with a smile on her face. There's a bit of a uh, a raised eyebrow look when she's yeah. like, "Let me get this straight. You ha- you had bought a hunt in the Northwest Territories and already knew you had that in your pocket, and you decided." Well, yeah, let's apply for Alaska for and because when I told her, I said, "Honey, what could be better than one doll sheep hunt?" And she just looked right at me and she goes, "A stone sheep hunt." Yeah. And I said, "No, two <laughs> doll sheep hunts." 
And she's no like, kidding. did you draw another one? Well, who, so I do who do we Alaska. blame that on? Do we blame that on on uh, on Brendan or I mean, who who puts you up to that? I, it's, I think that's I a just, Brendan Burns thing. I just or think was it um, Lance? I just think hunting two doll sheep definitely sounds better than <laughs> one. But my wife, she says, uh, aren't you already going on a doll sheep hunt? I said, yep. And I said, now I'm going on two. But uh, I, the reason I bring all this up and is um, I got to get that at- Atlas trainer and get we after it. We need to put you to work is what we need to do. Yeah, for sure. But, uh, you know, I yeah, might the have Atlas to start out with it. Has been, we have been, uh, it has been selling like you cannot believe. Um, and for everybody that doesn't know what we're talking about, um, we've taken our uh, our frame and suspension system and we took a design that we'd actually been kind of sitting on for, you know, some years. And, uh, you know, when the whole fitness and, and you know, uh, when, when this all took place and that was starting to become a very regular thing in, the out, in you know, the outdoors and hunting world. Brad, you almost said it, the fitness craze. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, it is. Um, when that yeah, all it's took a good place, thing. we... We yeah no it's a great thing and and we um you know uh, I I got to hand it you know I mean Floyd you know was was very serious about you know putting it back on the market and getting going with it and and I would tell you that that you know Mark Denham and and Jake Rush um, you know who you know work at the shop here and are an integral part of what we do um, those guys took it to heart and you know Mark uh, you know Mark was you know right in this thing from the very get go. And, um, you know, we, it, it's literally been selling like hotcakes. Um, and I think so people explain it love, to me. Expl- explain it, what it, it is. It's our frame and suspension system, Jake, or uh, Jay, with a, um, with a plate on the back that has an Olympic-style weight bar that allows you to put weight on it, and then, um, you know, you can put a collar on it to hold the weight on. And so basically what it allows you to do, it allows you to, to very systematically, methodically um, put weight on your back for what you need to train for that, you know, particular day. And uh, Okay, so, so I mean it will fit 10, 20, you know, 25, 45. It'll fit those, those yeah, Olympic I mean, style plates. It, What's the most you take, could put on it? Um, you know, I think 90, we've put two 45-pound plates on it, which brought it up, you know, that's 90, and then, you know, plus what the pack weighs. So, um, you know, it just depends on, on what a guy wants to put on there. But, you know, typically two full plates, um, there are certain plates that aren't as thick that you can put on there. But, you know, we've had guys, you know, loaded up with, you know, 10-pound plates, and we've had guys loaded up with, you know, like a 25 and a, and a 10 or, I mean, that's the nice thing is you can put whatever increment on there that, that, you know, you're using or you need to, you know, progressively get, you know, higher as you get stronger. Or, I mean, that, that's really the beauty of this thing is that you can, you know, you can uh, customize that load for you. Yeah. So, in in other words, so you sell the Atlas trainer and then people can get their own plates um, in their own hometown, correct. wherever they're at. And pretty Correct. much universal. The same, yep. it fits the same plate that would be on the, say, the bench press bar or whatever at your local yep. gym. It, it, yeah, it's an Olympic, it's an Olympic size, um, you know, weight bar, um, just coming off the, the 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 back of the pack. And uh, the nice thing about it is, is that if you're not using the Atlas trainer when you're training, uh, at that point, you simply you can. Some guys take the plate off. Or some guys just unscrew the, uh, the the bar itself, and then they put their pack right on top of it and use it as it is. So that's the nice thing is, is that you're training with the same pack, you know, shoulder harness and belt system that you would be taking into the, you know, into the bush. So nice. um, and it's, it, it's been like received crazy. really, really well. It's not only being received by, you know, the the hunting community. It's been received by you know the, uh, the 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 fitness and and CrossFit and I mean there's guys that are really really enjoying you know hitting the trails and you know it, it, we've had people tell us that you know this was the one component I was missing because I was you know I just I just wanted to get something out into the you know onto my local trails and so it's been really really successful. 
That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Um, I've been seeing on Instagram these muley fanny packs. Oh, yeah. What's up with that? Yeah, we've been, um, you know, we've sold the, the muley fanny pack for years. Uh, and, you know, we just kind of wanted to have a, a, you know, a little March Madness going on. And this is our day, idea of March Madness. So, um, you know, the muley fanny is, uh, um, it, it's a really versatile pack. You can wear it as, you know, a, a fanny pack by itself. You can attach it to our frame um, or... Uh, you know, a lot of guys will carry it, and because it attaches to our compression straps on our bags, you know, on our backpacks. So a lot of guys literally will load their day gear in that, um, attach it to our our our, uh, our backpack when they're when they're backpacking into a place, and they literally will detach it and put it on and and walk off and wear it just you know by itself. So um, it's just a really versatile piece of gear, um, 149.99, and it's I mean for what you're getting and what people are using it, um, you know it's uh, it's just been again it's been a really good seller out of us, uh, you know for our our system and and uh, it's just another piece of our our versatile uh, backpack. So that's uh, that that's going on right now. Right on, buddy. I wanted to um, conclude our conversation and talk a little bit about, um, it's been a while now since the Swarovski BTX has come out, and oh, yeah. wanted to talk to you about customers' um, feedback, your own feedback, um, you know, your own interpretation in the field uh, of, of, you know, what you've seen personally and, and how it's working for you and what customers are saying about it as well. Um, Jay, that's a loaded question right there. You wanted to leave this for last? I mean, we may, not, we, we may have to run <laughs> this as a separate episode. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, Jay, first of all, um, I can honestly tell you having had, you know, numerous uh, – scouting and then you know i hunted with the boys um uh you know ty had a late season whitetail hunt um that we used it i think i got seven or eight days in with the boys on on that hunt um to put it really simply this is one of the best pieces of gear most innovative thinking um game-changing pieces of gear that that i've ever used um it's uh I, I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed looking through it. Um, uh, I, I've used it in the 65. I've used it in the 85. I've used it in the 95. Um, I would tell you that they're all appropriate. They're all um, good. Um, I, I found myself using the 85 more often than any of the others. Uh I think the reason is is that because um, there's a wider field of view, um, I in many of the cases I was not looking at the longest distances, um, so that's why the 30 power and the field of view were were really really nice. Um, although I did find myself in certain places, you know, you know, putting the 95 on and and looking at those, you know, in terms of miles. Um, I, I just think that this has more capabilities and has I, – I think, that Jay, that this is a product that's going to basically lead more people into realizing the value of long-range glassing, whether you're scouting or rather you're hunting or rather you're just helping a buddy. It, I, I literally think that this is that product that's going to change people's mind um, about glassing long-range. Um, because really the, the, the idea and the weight of the products that were before this, um, I mean, they're all, at minimum, they're all at least two pounds heavier than these. So right. when you have a 95 and a BTX hooked up, you're only at six pounds. And so, you know, the COAs, as good as a piece of gear as that is, the Koas are, you know, they weigh in at 13 or 14 pounds. And uh, so I, I, you know, I just, I, I literally think that the feedback we're hearing from customers, um, 
you know, I, and I use this word all the time, I, it, 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 they're just, they're addictive. You know, they're, they're literally addictive. Yeah, for sure. Um, I really like the optical quality of them. I like the weight of them. Um, you know, for me, the Koas were always a challenge. I, I loved the Koas, and I used the heck out of the Koas. I always sat behind the Koas wishing they were a straight, not an angled eyepiece. <laughs> right. You know, as much as I've used the uh, BTX now, I, I still find myself, I love the BTX, but I still find myself look, sitting behind it, wishing it was a straight eyepiece. Sure. Um, but but I think the weight savings alone is is a huge uh, winner, uh, you know, across the board, and you know, kind of a game changer in itself. And I'm sure some of the other companies are going to be scrambling to try and you know come up with some, you know some of their own type of long range glassing products as well. Um, but optically, yeah, that's phenomenal. Um, I, I haven't used the 85. I have the 65 and the 95, but I don't have the 85. I have looked at the 85 in your shop. Um, you know, I think crazy weight is, you know, the 65 at 4.14 pounds. Uh, you know, yeah. it's pretty crazy to have such a power pack and, you know, 65 millimeter objective uh, at only 4.14 4 pounds. And then you throw the 95, and it adds, you know, it's a, just under six and a half pounds, or six and a quarter, I think. Um, right. It, you know, it does add two pounds, but I still go back to, you know, I wish it was in a straight, um, but, it, you know, I'm not taking anything away from it other than, I, you know, I don't even like a, an angled, uh, angled spotting scope. I like a straight spotting scope. Sure. So, it, it, it's probably just me and the fact that, you know, using, uh, you know, being a straight lens, you know, guy my whole life, it, it's hard for me to be kind of looking down at that angle. And then half the guys, well, more than half the guys that call me and ask me about it, they say, oh, we like angle better. The angle is why, you know, why we're looking at it. Right. Yeah, and then we, I say, well, if the angle is yep. why you're looking at it, you're going to love the weight savings, and you're going to absolutely love the, the, the quality, the optic quality. Well, I think the biggest thing, too, Jay, is that the guys that, I mean, the guys that just literally hated using a spotting scope because they couldn't, you know, they didn't want to, you know, With they, the one they eye. couldn't squint, they couldn't close the one eye, or they didn't want to wear a patch, or, you know, I mean, they just, you know, they didn't want to hold their hand up there. I get it. And I think that, that, that really what people that are buying this product and taking it out, I, I, I think the guys that just literally did not like looking through a spotting scope and hated using them, I think they're looking at this going, this like has answered their 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 biggest gripe with spotting scopes, and and they're realizing that that you know whether you're using it with a thirty or thirty five power or whether you're putting the me on or whatever you're doing the you know the one point seven extender whatever. These guys are literally, it's like somebody has just opened up a new world to them where, you know, they're glassing at ranges they've never glassed for in their entire life. And they're 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 doing it in in a comfort, you know, uh, that they've never done in their entire life. And I think guys are opening, you know, just could completely open their eyes because, you know, when you have both eyes open, and even if you're at thirty or thirty five power, your brain takes information in and jumbles it up better and gives you an image in your mind <laughs> better than you do when you have one eye closed. It, it, yeah. that's, it, it's just a fact. Well, and you can do it for a longer period of time. Absolutely. I think the it's biggest thing comfort. I hear from guys is how, much, how comfortable it is for a longer period of time, whereas some guys might be able to look, you know, kind of pan around with their spotting scope, which I don't recommend, but a lot of people do. But they can't do it very long, whereas with this, you can literally sit comfortably and, and glass for hours upon hours Right. Um, you know, looking through it, and you know, you're not getting eye strain. It's just, it's just a way better system. Um, and and you know, talking about that competition that we were talking about earlier with the rangefinders, 
it is going to be exciting, I think, over the next two, three, four, five years just to see what some of the other companies, because, you know, Swarovski usually sets the bar pretty high, and then, uh, you know, typically a lot of the other companies try and come up with their own version. Um, hopefully the boys at Swarovski are just keep, you know, keep going and going and going and keep innovating, and as well as the other companies, because I think it's, well, you know, it I, only I, makes I, us as it, hunters better if, if they're constantly trying to outdo each other. We reap correct. the benefit of that. I mean, to your point exactly, Jay, the, the uh, you know, Swarovski comes out with that, that 95, um, you know, a few years back, and, and, you know, for intents and all intents and purposes, you know, that spotting scope is just sold as well, if not better, than any spotting scope out there right now. And Zeiss um, this year came out and, and, uh, and, and put their 95 on the market, you know, the, uh, the Harpia. And um, I, I have not, in all fairness, I have not had it in the field yet. I'm waiting for my, my first one. Um, I, I'm intrigued by it. Um, it's it's got the you know Zeiss's best of the best you know HT and FL glass, um, and I'm really excited to see what's going on. And and you know whether you're a Zeiss, Sarovsky, or like a guy, you got to look back at that whole situation and go, you know what? These guys are listening. They realize that that you know there's a market out there for this stuff, and they're they're coming out with new products and and, and pushing on it. And I think that's great for all of us. For sure, yeah. As you know, a consumer, it gives us choices. The, the, yeah, it gives us choices, and that's the best gives us thing. Choices. For sure. Well, buddy, thanks so much for coming on. Um, you're you're getting all fired up for that elk tag that you drew, right? Well, um, <laughs> I did not draw an elk tag. Um, <laughs> our good buddy Cody Goff did draw an elk tag. So I uh, I was di- I was I, digging you. <laughs> yeah, I know. That hurt a little bit. Yeah. But you know, I don't know. It's gonna be an interesting year. You know, we're we're it looks like it's raining outside my office a little bit right now, but um I'm hoping uh that we get a little bit more moisture than what we've got because um you know I I, I pray for all the guys that did draw the tags that the, the moisture comes. So we yeah. uh, we don't have the snowpack that we normally do, and you know in the higher elevations, and 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 I know that we need a little rain in some of the other spots. So, well, I know that on prior podcasts I took some heat. Not um, you know just mainly guys sending me personal messages took a little heat for kind of calling it what it is, and and um, I hope I'm wrong, and I hope I'm proved to be wrong, and I'll be the first person to uh, eat crow and say that I was wrong, um, certainly if I'm proven to be wrong. But uh, it, it wasn't looking good going into this draw. I know we've had a few little storms here and there, and, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a rancher's grandson, so I, I hope it rains every day of the year. But, you know, it's one of those things. It is what it is, uh, you know, with I think I got 14 or 15 elk points myself in Arizona. I wasn't going to risk um, my points, nor was I going to risk my, you know, one use of my point guard to draw on a year like this and then be able to give the tag back. That just in exactly. my point situation, that wasn't what I thought was the prudent thing to do. Now, with all those guys out there that actually do have elk tags, like you have the tag in your pocket and – you know, unless you're truly after just some ginormous bull, you should probably go ahead with it um, and make the best of it. And, um, you know, it is what it is. Maybe it'll, we'll get showers over the next month and, you know, have that early spring green up and maybe everything will be fine. I have had some talk with different outfitters and stuff on the podcast that didn't think it was that big of a deal. And they thought over the next, you know, 60 days was very critical. And, and I hope they're right. Well, Jay, that's, you know, that, that's a gamble, and there's nothing wrong. You know, I mean, look, the way I see it is this. I, I put in for bonus points this year. And, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm putting in for myself and, you know, the wife and the two kids, and and I just looked at it and said, yeah, I'm just, I, I just I wasn't going to gamble with it this year. I could have done the point guard, could have done all, all that stuff, but I just felt, you know, I kind of put my eggs in, in other baskets and, and felt that, uh, you know, I could go this year, you know, without doing so. And and, and maybe that's a bad choice. Um, 
you know, the fact that maybe me and my my uh, my four, you know, tag entries gave somebody else a chance to hunt this year is the way I, I'm looking at it. So <laughs> maybe that'll maybe you're that'll doing your for me civic to, duty exactly. Maybe I'll maybe I'll be a little a little rewarded in a couple of years. <clears throat> so right yeah, on, so we'll buddy. See, we'll, we'll see what happens. Thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for sponsoring the po- podcast. Absolutely. And, Thank uh, you for having us. Thanks we, for uh, sure. we love doing it. It's uh, it's always good for us, and and our customers seem to uh, respond to uh, to to the J Scott podcast, and that's uh, that's good for us. And I appreciate everything you do. Sounds good, buddy. I want to remind the listeners: one eight hundred two nine one eight zero six five is the number there at the Outdoorsman uh, or Outdoorsman's dot com. Remember to use the J Scott promo code. Give Cody and the guys a call and uh, tell them what you need. Uh, give them your, uh, give them, give them the toughest questions you can come up with, and uh, test their knowledge. And uh, I know you'll be happy. So, uh, Cody, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing time. And uh, I appreciate I'm it gonna, very much, Jay. Did you hear that I'm uh, resurrecting my uh, uh, Olympic downhill um, uh, <laughs> career at at age 45? I thought it was a good time to. Uh, Get back into the Olympic downhill mode. Yeah, for God's sakes, wear a helmet. That's <laughs> all I got to say. Every time I talk to Dar, Dar's like, well, I've been training every day. Have you blown your knee out yet? Because I want to go on that doll sheep hunt. <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm sure he's, uh, I'm sure he's, 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 uh, he's paralleling your training right now. You just don't know it. He's waiting yeah, for, for sure. one of your freak uh, skiing accidents. Yeah, I, I think you'll to, be good um, as long as you're not uh, as long as you're not a- acting and uh, and trying to to uh, 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 you know look like Lindsey Vaughn or Ingmar Stenmark flying down yeah. the mountain. I definitely need to keep both skis on the snow for sure. Um, hey, I want to remind the listeners out there this Tuesday coming up, uh, March twentieth. Uh, I'm actually coming back from Colorado. I'm flying back to do the uh, turkey seminar at uh, there on the uh, Calvary uh, Church. Uh, if you need more information, you can send me a message. Uh, you can go to Christian Hunters of America's website. They are also uh, raffling off a Gould's turkey hunt uh, down in Mexico with, uh, with Dar and I's uh, gouldsturkeyhunt.com and Colburn and Scott Outfitters. So Love to see you guys out at the seminar uh, next Tuesday. The doors open at 6. Seminar starts at 7. Cody, thanks for your time, and I'll be Thank chatting you very with much, you. Okay, Jay. buddy?